I'm something of an artist myself. I do those silhouettes with scissors and black paper. Here's one of Ada Rayhan looking the other way. I have to do them like that because I'm no good at noses. Mrs. Levi, the straight free doctors leaves in five minutes, and if we don't get there on time... But we will, Mr. Temper, and not only will Horace Vendergelder give you permission to marry his niece, Ermengarde, but he will also dance at your wedding, and not alone either, because I happen to be engaged in finding him a suitable second wife himself. What he really wants is someone steady to clean the house. As my late husband, Mr. Levi, always said, marriage is a bribe to make a housekeeper think she's a householder. I know all about it, Mrs. Levi. Half of New York says he's going to propose to Miss Irene Malloy this very afternoon. Which is exactly why I'm on my way to Yonkers this morning, Mr. Temper, and can take on your case and knock off four lovebirds with one stone or whatever off for all see. And well, well, well. What do you think of that? I have nothing here to pay my train fare with, only large bills fives and sevens. I have some change here somewhere, Mrs. Levi. I just hope this isn't a wild goose chase. And speaking of poultry, I'm also available for fresh Jersey eggs, surgical corsets reboned, ears pierced, pierced ears reflugged. Mrs. Levi. Tell me, Mrs. Levi, what's in all of this for you? A living, Mr. Kemper. Some people paint, some sew. I meddle. I have always been a woman who arranges things for the pleasure and the profit it derives. I have always been a woman who arranges things like furniture and daffodils and lives. When a man with a timid tongue meets a girl with a diffident air, why should the tortured creatures beat around the bush when heaven knows Mother Nature always needs a little push? So I put my hand in here. I put my hand in there. And a girl over six foot three loves a man who comes up to her ear. Surely it's obvious she'll never be seduced till some kind soul condescends to give her bow a little boost. So I put my hand in there. I put my hand in here. I have always been a woman who arranges things. It's my duty to assist the Lord above. I have always been a woman who arranges things like luncheon parties, poker games, and love. My aplomb in cosmetic art turned a frock to a Trump lady fair. She had a countenance a little bit like fruit, but oh, today you would swear the Lord himself applied the rouge. I put my hand in here. Now you go buy our tickets, get a window seat, order lunch,
launch and I'll meet you on board. Ephraim Levi, I'm going to get married again. I'm going to marry Horace Vandergelder for his money and send it out circulating among the people like rainwater the way you taught me. And I want a sign from you. Sometime today that you approve. Oh, it won't be a marriage in the sense we had one, but I shall certainly make him happy. And I'm tired, Ephraim. Tired of living from hand to mouth. So I want that sign. Mrs. Levi. Sometime today. Now you don't worry, Mr. Kemper. We'll make that train. We'll get to Yonkers. You'll marry Ermengarde. Just leave everything to me. For when my little piggy wiggles, the young maiden gets the giggles. Then I make my knuckles act if my says she's so attractive. Then I move my index digit and they both begin to fidget. Then I clutch my palm, the preacher reads a song when I put my hand. of the people in this world are fools, and the rest of us are in great danger of contamination. <laughs> Why, even I was young once, which was foolish. And I got married, which was foolish. And I was poor, which was more foolish than anything else in the world. Then my wife died, which was foolish as well. I grew old, which was sensible of me, and became rich, friendless, and mean. Which in this world is about as far as you can go. Oh, I know what you're saying. Why would a man of as much good sense as myself be thinking of anything as foolish as getting married? The answer is simple. This house without a woman would be an empty shell. And pretty dirty, too. It takes a woman, all powdered and pink, to joyously clean out the drain in the sink. And it takes an angel with long golden lashes and soft as in fingers for dumping the ashes. Yes, it takes a noble, a dainty woman, a sweetheart, a mistress, a wife. Oh, yes, it takes a woman, a fragile woman, to bring you the sweet thing in life. The frail young maiden who's constantly there for washing and blue and chewing the mare and it takes a female for setting the table and weaning the jersey and cleaning the stable yes it takes a woman a dainty woman a sweetheart a mistress a wife oh yes it takes a woman a fragile woman to bring you the sweet thing in life and so
and lovingly set out the trap for the mice. He's a joy and treasure for practically speaking. To whom can you turn when the plumbing is leaking? To the dainty woman, that fragile woman, that sweetheart, that mistress, that wife. Oh, yes, it takes a woman. Oh, Woman, to bring you the sweet thing in life. Oh yes, it takes a woman, a dainty woman, a sweetheart, a mistress, a wife. Oh yes, it takes a woman, a dainty woman, to bring you the sweet thing in life. Congratulations! A thousand congratulations! What? Congratulations, Mr. Vandergelder. All New York is buzzing with the news that you practically proposed to Irene Malloy. The streets are lined with eligible young ladies prostrate with grief. All my congratulations and sympathy! Sympathy? Did I say that? A slip of the tongue, that's all. No, I'm delighted with the happy news. After all, she wasn't easy to unload. By that, I mean you know what people said, although I, for one, never believed the rumors. No, I didn't. Rumors? What rumors? Nothing to get upset about, Mr. Vandergelder. I mean, according to all known facts, her first husband passed on quite naturally. It's just that he went so sudden. A few spoons of chowder she made special for him, and... <laughs> but it could happen to anyone. No, there's no truth in it. Just one word of advice, Mr. Vandergelder. Eat out. Now, see here, Mrs. Levi, are you trying to tell me that Mrs. Malloy... I mean Malloy... to say nothing, Mr. Vandergelder. Just friendly advice. Keep away from the chowder. By the way, she's ordered her wedding gown. Beautiful. You should see it. Black. <laughs> but as I said before, Mr. Vandergelder, congratulations on your forthcoming nuptials, and may you rest in... I mean, may guardian angels watch over you both particularly at dinner. Now look here, Mrs. Levi. You introduced me to Mrs. Malloy, and rumors or no rumors, I intend on taking a call on her this afternoon as the lady. Very well, Mr. Vandergelder. Then there's nothing more for me to do but to go back to New York and tell the other girl, the heiress, not to wait. Wait, what did you say? Nothing. A word. Heiress. Articulate, Mrs. Levi. I demand a name. A name? It's, um, uh, it's money. Ernestina Money. What a lovely, lovely name. Picture, if you will, hair as shiny as a newly minted dime, eyes as a big round as silver dollars, skin as soft and mossy as an old greenback. Feel it now. Age 19. Ooh. Weight 102. Ooh. Weight 47. Weight 47? That's with the money belt. <laughs> Now, I could arrange for you to meet this Ernestina this very afternoon. Ah, uh, I ain't got time, Mrs. Levi. I have to go to New York this afternoon with my niece, Ermengarde, until she forgets about a certain Ambrose. I could do that for you, Mr. Vandergelder. I know just how to handle such things. Then I have to march in the 14th Street Parade. What an amazing coincidence. Guess you've been chosen to lie on the main float, the spirit of 14th Street, Miss Money. Her mother was a cat, you know. All right, Mrs. Levi. I'll meet this money on that parade float, but I still intend on paying a call on Mrs. Malloy this afternoon. Oh, dear, what races you make me run. Very well, Mr. Vandergelder. I'll meet you on that bench in front of Mrs. Malloy's hat shop at 2.30 as usual. Hold it, Mrs. Levi. Suppose I don't like Miss Malloy, and I'm not interested in this money, neither. Well, then I happen to have. One more name on my list, Mr. Vandergelder. A name I know as well as my own, but let's not go into that now. It'll come up by itself all in good time, don't you worry about that. Oh, but wait till you see Ernestina Horace. A vision, a dream. It's a woman all powdered and pink to joyously clean out the drain in the sink. And it takes an angel with long golden lashes and stronger than fingers for jumping the ashes. Yes, it takes a woman. Da 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 da
yes, it takes a woman. You know, Ephraim, I think I'll have that room done over in blue wallpaper. Yes, in blue. Ermengarde, Ambrose, come on out here. We've got plans to make. to live. We could live on holidays, Cornelia. Did you forget what we did last Christmas? All those canned tomatoes when Ben exploded and you and I cleaned up the mess all afternoon. Did you call that living? No. Barnaby, you and I are going to New York. You mean close the door? Uh-huh. Cornelius, we can. We'll have to. Some more canned tomatoes are going to explode. Holy kabooses, how do you know? I'm going to light a candle under them. That's how I know. Such a smell, customers won't be able to come to the place for 24 hours. That'll get us an evening free. We're going to New York, Barnaby. We're going to live. We're going to spend our money. We're going to be in danger. We're going to be arrested. Holy kabooses. And one more thing. We're not coming back to Yonkers and eat kiss the girl. Cornelius, you can't do that. You don't know any girls. I'm 33 years old. I've got to begin sometime. But I'm only 17, Cornelius. It isn't urgent for me. Mark Barnaby, Elevated Dream, The Lights of Broadway, The South Whale at Barnaby's Museum. South Whale? A South Whale. What do you say, Barnaby? Yes, Cornelius, yes. Now, the first thing to do is to make you financially independent. I know. I'll find you a job. Can you dance? I'm an artist. I paint. Well, then, my card. This is Dollar Lee card. Ain't you sure how to dance? Now, there's a man, Rudolph Reisenweber, at the Harmonia Gardens restaurant on 14th Street. I'll give you a note for him, and we'll can see if he can have you both entered in a polka contest tonight. The prize is a week's engagement and a gold cup. Oh, the cups we've won, Ephraim and me. Hold on, Mrs. Levi. No fiancé of mine is going to step foot in a cafe. Uh, I don't mind saying, surprised of a question. Not acquaintances, Mr. Kemper, friends, dear friends from days gone by. My late husband, Ephraim Lee, I believe in life and any place you can find it. Cafes, ballrooms, yes, even theaters. Why, even when times were bad, every Saturday night like clockwork down those stairs of the Harmonia Gardens we came, Ephraim and me. It's all very well to go down like clockwork, Mrs. Levi, but you'll have to earn regard to work there. <laughs> It's the only way to show Horace Vandergelder we need business. Now, you go to the Harmonia Gardens this afternoon and say Mrs. Levi sent you. And incidentally, tell Rudolph that Dolly's coming back. And I want a table for two and a chicken for eight o'clock tonight. The ones in the bottom look all right, Cornelius. Now hold the candle under the ones in the top. Not too close. Get rolled up like they're ready to burn. <coughs> Holy kabooses, Cornelius. I can smell it up here. Let's get the rest, Barney. We're going to New York. Outside of Yonkers, way out there beyond this pigtail Barnaby, there's a slick town Barnaby. Gonna find adventure in the evening air. Girls in white in a perfume night where the lights as bright as the dawn. Put on your Sunday clothes, we're gonna ride through town in one of those new horse drawn open cars. We'll see the shows at Delmonico's and we'll close the town in a world. And we won't come home until we've kissed a girl. Sunday's clothes when you feel down and out. Come down the street and have your picture took. 
dressed like a dream your spirit seemed to turn about that sunday shine is a certain sign that you feel as fine as you look beneath your parasol the world is all a smile to make you feel brand new down to your toes get out your bed with your patent leathers your pleats and muscles and bones all is your blue monday in your sunday clothes Holy caboose, this stuff is really fun. Wow! Come on! Put on your Sunday clothes when you feel that man's out. Sit down the street and have your picture shown. Just like a dream, your spirit seems to turn. You feel brand new down to your toes. Get out your feathers, your cats and leathers, your feet and muscles and bones. For it's no blue Monday in your Sunday thought you knew. Why, the marriage Mrs. Levi is arranging between Mr. Horace Van de Gelder, the well-known Yonkers half-a-millionaire, and my employer and friend, Mrs. Irene Malloy. 
Although, if you ask me, he'll never take the place of our late husband, Mr. Peter Malloy. May he rest in peace. Wherever he is, <laughs> I'm not sure. He was a caution, you know. Oh, it's all too much. What with late husbands and new marriages, and on top of everything else, Miss Mortimer returning this hat for the third time. Same old story. She wants more cherries and feathers. Cherries and feathers. To catch a bow, I suppose. Although, if you ask me, she'd do better with a nice heavy veil. I told her ribbons down our back is what we'll be wearing this summer if we want to catch a gentleman's eye, but she'd have none of it. Cherries and feathers she wants on today of all days when that poor dear sweet Mrs. Malloy has enough on her mind what with Mr. With Hart. what, Minnie? Uh, <laughs> with the door. It's stuck. It's stuck? Then push. And as I was saying, Mrs. Malloy, I could bite up my tongue for the things I've said and the things I'm going to say, but as long as I've gotten this far, I might as well go all the way. Mrs. Malloy, why have... Why? Say it, Minnie. Why have I decided to marry Horace Vandergelder? Oh, Mrs. Malloy, I didn't ask you that. I would rather die on the rack than ask you such a personal question. But as long as you did bring it up, I am marrying Horace Vandergelder for one reason, and one reason alone, Minnie, to get away from the millinery business. I hate hats. Mrs. Malone. And I can no longer stand being suspected of being a wicked woman with nothing to show for it. Oh, Mrs. Malone. Oh, don't protest, Minnie. All millineresses are suspected of being wicked women. That's why I can't go into restaurants or theaters or balls. That's all the proof they'd need. Take my word for it, Minnie. Either I marry Horace Vandergelder or I break out of this place like a fire engine. Ooh. Oh, no. Not Miss Mortimer again. Miss Mortimer, I'll take care of it. No, Minnie. Leave it be. You can make another hat for Miss Mortimer if you'd like. I'm wearing this one myself. Mrs. Malloy, you can't. You're a widow, and, and that hat, well, it's provocative, that's what. Is it, Minnie? Well, who knows who may walk into the shop today? And provocative may be just what I want to be. Mrs. Malone.
Mrs. Malloy, why, of course, it couldn't make me ask this next question I'm about to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. Do you love Horace Vandegelder? No, Minnie, I don't. Peter Malloy, God bless his soul, was my share of love, and I'm not saying I was shortchanged. Once is enough for a woman, as long as it's true love. And it was. Minnie, look. There are two men staring at the shop. Men? Why, I do believe they mean to come in here. Men? In the shop? Oh, Mrs. Lawyer, what shall we do? Do? Why, flirt with them, of course. I'll give you the short one. Mrs. Lawyer. And you with all that talk about love. Love enough I've had, Minnie. It's a bit of adventure I could do with now. We'll get them all heated up, then we'll drop them cold. It'll be good practice for married life. Now, you go back into the workroom, Minnie. I can think of some ways we can perk up our appearances. Besides, a bit of a wake will only make them nervous and easier for us to... If you say vampire, I'll scream. Oh, vampire! Ah! And so... I'll try to make it easier to find me in the stillness of July. Because a breeze might stir a rainbow up behind me that might happen to catch the gentleman's eye. Oh, Minnie, we'll get an adventure out of this yet. Sitting on that bench, Cornelius, any story of an adventure? You don't have to ask, Barnaby. When you're in one, you'll know it all right. How much money have you got left? Forty cents for the train back, thirty cents for dinner, twenty cents to feed a whale, ninety cents. Why? When those women come out, we'll have to pretend to be customers. Customers, that's it. Maybe the best thing to do is make them think we're rich. That way we won't have to spend anything. There's two men about town looking for hats for ladies. Good afternoon, Mrs. Malloy. Oh, here, Cordelia Jackal. Here, Barnaby Tucker. My pleasure, gentlemen. Now, what can I do for you? Hmm. Well, you're saying hats. Where can ladies about town looking for hats for ladies? We want a hat. <laughs> for a lady, of course. And everybody said, go to Mrs. Malloy's because she's so pretty. I mean, her hats are so pretty. And so reasonable, Cornelius. As reasonable as under a dollar, she needs enough to feed a whale. Uh, you've got to pay him no mind, ma'am. He's come all the way from Yonkers to see the stuffed whale, and he's all excited. Just keep an eye on the street, Barnaby, and maybe you'll see it pass by. <laughs> Is it big and black with mean little red eyes? Yes. <laughs> it's sitting right on that bench. Uh, excuse me. But did you say Yonkers, Mr. Hackle? Oh, yes, ma'am, Yonkers. And forgive me for saying this, but you should see Yonkers. By that, I mean perhaps Mr. Malloy would like to see Yonkers, too. Oh, well, I'm a widow, Mr. Hackle. You are, Barbie. She's a widow. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sure Mr. Malloy would have enjoyed Yonkers, especially in that hat. I mean, on you, of course, not Mr. Malloy. Yeah, you rest in peace, Mr. Hackle, Barbie. Look at what that, will you? I'd like to see Mrs. Malloy. If you should ever happen to have an afternoon free, I'd be more than pleased to show you Yonkers from top to bottom. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Hackle, I may be there sooner than you think. Oh, really? You see, I have a friend who lives in Yonkers. Do you? Perhaps you know her. Perhaps we do. Although it's usually silly to ask in cases like that, isn't it? <laughs> it's a Mr. Vandergelder. Oh, Miss Vandergelder? Who's Vandergelder paying fees? Do you know no, him? No, 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 no. Oh, no, Mr. No. Vandergelder is a substantial man and well-liked, they tell me. A lovely man, Mrs. Malloy. Just lovely. Has only one fault as far as I know. He's a hearted man. Cornelius, I think... I think... Oh, perhaps your friend would like this hat. Look out! Begging your pardon, Mrs. Malloy. Gentlemen, what are you doing? I'll bet Mrs. Malloy will explain later. Gentlemen, really, you must come out of here this instant. We're as innocent as to be, Mrs. Malloy. Well, really. Mr. Hackle, Mr. Tucker, I must insist you both come out of here at this moment. I'll be forced to... Mr. Vandergelder. Mrs. Malloy, I don't suppose Mrs. Levi is in the way. She used to bump the hickey out on that bench over ten minutes ago. Well, she can just come and look for me after all. But I make a point with 
So when I play for them, they'll be on time. Men? Men, Mr. Vandergelder? What would men be doing in a lady's hat shop? Well, let's go back into my workroom. I'm so anxious for you to see it. Uh, so you did. So, Mr. Vandergelder, what's new in the hay and cheese business? I hear you have three friends, all hard as nails. Uh, I mean... What on earth are you talking about? Yonkers. I hear it's a very beautiful city. And who, may I ask, has been telling you about Yonkers? Uh, nobody. Uh, a friend. A friend? You see, he was... He? Uh, a customer, Mr. Vandergelder. Someone quite well-to-do, as a matter of fact. He was in here buying hats for ladies. You may even know him, although it's usually silly to ask in cases like this, isn't it? It's a Mr. Cornelius Hackle. Hackle? Did you say Hackle? Uh, yes. He happens to be my head clerk. That's all, Mrs. Malloy. I demand an explanation. And I'm going to give it to you. Why shouldn't she know Cornelius Hackle? Everybody in New York knows Cornelius Hackle. He's here at the opera, in all the fashionable homes. Why, he's at the Harmonia Gardens restaurant three times a week. Impossible. He's only got $146.35, and I keep it in my own safe. Oh, Mr. Vandergelder, you're killing me. He's one of the Hackles. They built the canal. What canal? The, the Panama. Both. It ain't the same man. Who took the horses out of Jenny Lynn's carriage and pulled her through the streets? Cornelius Hackle. And who dressed up as a waiter at the Fifth Avenue Hotel and dropped an oyster down Mrs. Astor's? Oh, I can't say it, but it was Cornelius. He's the playboy of New York. Now, Irene, don't deny it. I can see you were taken with him just like everybody else. But, Dolly, what are you saying? Really, Dolly, I've only seen this man once in my life, and I must tell you that. Of course. <laughs> there's a man in it! You'll see here, Mrs. Lloyd. There's a man in that one. No, Mr. Vandergelder, you can't. It's too dangerous. No man that hides in ladies' closets can frighten me. Now stand aside. No man, indeed. I'm sure you'd make short work of any man. Those muscles, I can see them now rippling back and forth under your coat. Ripple, 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 back and forth. Ripple, ripple, ripple. For the last time, Mrs. Levi, will you stand aside? Stand indeed, Mr. Vandergelder. That's exactly what the courts will want to know when you're accused of entering that closet without a search warrant. I mean, what do you stand for if you don't stand for the law of this great land? I know what I stand for. I stand for motherhood, America, and a hot lunch for orphans. Take off your hat, sir. Betsy Ross's flag is passing. Do you see him on the hill at Gettysburg? Neath that great triumphal arch. If you see him while he's trampling through the grapes of wrath, stand up and march, march, march. My speech has not affected you, sir. I came here as an immigrant girl at 14 years of age from a land that oppressed my people, and I must ever hear what was said by that great and patriotic American, uh, Moses. I stand for motherhood, America, and a hot sun for orphans. Take off your hat, sir. There's a tear-stained eagle passing. Do you see him on the bridge at Waterloo? Neath that gray tie of the line. If you hear him singing Dixie and the sugar cane, step in my life. I stand for motherhood, America, and a hot sun. Vandergelder, there couldn't possibly be a man in that closet. Ah, I do. God bless you. Mrs. Lloyd. All right, Mr. Vandergelder, there is a man in that cupboard. Uh -huh. And another under that table.
riddle. What's that? And there also happens to be a very simple explanation for this. But for the present, good afternoon. <gasps> good Lord, the whole room is crawling with men. I'll never get over it. I'll take it. I'll see you later this afternoon, Mr. Vandergelder. Yes, you will, Mrs. Levi, with a certain young lady on the last float at the end of the parade. Good afternoon, Mrs. Malloy. Oh. Mrs. Malloy, I can explain everything. Mr. Hackle? I do not wish to hear any explanations. Just you and Mr. Tucker do me the favor of leaving my store at once, or else I'll call for Officer Gogarty. Well, if you ask me, Irene, calling an officer is letting them off too easy. The law courts, that's where they belong. I've been adding up the legal offenses these two have committed, and believe me, you've got grounds for at least two writs, a non coupled method, and a garnishing. Now, the first thing to do is to show that you've tried to settle it amicably first. Have a dinner with them. Dinner? Is that absolutely necessary, Dolly? It's the way things are done in the law, Irene. Dinner first, garnishing afterwards. Well, if it must be. Mr. Hackle, Mr. Tucker, you may take Miss Fay and myself to dinner tonight. Uh, delighted, Mrs. Malloy. I speak for Barnaby, too. Uh, now I hear there's a very nice restaurant on the railway station. Oh, no, Mr. Hackle. If the Harmonia Gardens is good enough for your fashionable friends, it's good enough for us. I hear they have a lovely orchestra there, Minnie. Oh, we couldn't go there, Mrs. Malloy. It isn't the money or anything. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the whale. It's the whale. No, it isn't the whale, Barnaby. It's, uh, it's the dancing. They have dancing where they take that exhibition even contest, and I don't know how it'll take me weeks, months, years to learn. This is Dolly Gallagher Levi, 33-year-old chief clerk taught how to dance. <laughs> now, it's very simple. You put one arm here and one arm... Oh, it's no use. I have absolutely no sense of rhythm. Absolutely no sense of rhythm is one of the primary requirements for learning by the Gallagher Levi method. Just give me five minutes of your time, Mr. Hackle, and I'll have you dancing through the streets. We'll start with lesson seven, the walk, kick, turn. Now, it's simple. Right foot touch, left foot touch, under, back, around, touch, out, through, around, behind, back, over, release, unfurl. That's wonderful. When I think of all the lucky women who'll find heaven in your arms. Let's go back to lesson one. Put your hand on her wrist and stand. Wrist. Her right in your left hand. And one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Look, I'm dancing. <laughs> well, I was. Of course you were, Mr. Hackle. Take the Someone whose arms you're in. Hold on to her tight and spin. And one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Wow, I'm dancing. Turn around and turn around, try floating through the air. Can't you be a little more aesthetic? Ah, uh, the word I think I'd use is athletic. Well, my heart is about to burst. My head is about to pop. And now that I'm dancing, who cares if I ever stop? Look, everyone, I, Cornelia Tackle, Lord, have danced. Your next, Mr. Tucker. Glide and step and then step and glide. And everyone, stand aside. Look, look, he's dancing. 
you could learn to polka if you were to be corso. Or the tango filled with passion seething. I was drawing the floors of the castle garden show. Well, whatever you do, for gosh sakes, keep breathing. For my heart is about to burst. My head is about to pop. And now that we're dancing, who cares if we ever stop? Mrs. Rose? Uh, the same. Pains in my back, aches in my side, stabs in my liver. I'm fine. <laughs> my daughter Fanny got married, you know. Did she? A year ago last September. It's been such a long time since you lived here, Mrs. Levi. Such a long time. Ephraim, oh. let me go. It's been long enough, Ephraim. Every evening for all these years, I've put out the cat, I've locked the door, I've made myself a little rum toddy. And before I went to bed, I said a prayer thanking God that I was independent, that no one else's life was mixed up with mine. Then one night, an oak leaf fell out of my Bible. I placed it there when you asked me to marry you, Ephraim. A perfectly good oak leaf but without color and without life. And I suddenly realized that I was like that leaf. For years I had not shed one tear, nor had I been filled with the wonderful hope that something or other was going to turn out well. And so I decided to rejoin the human race. And Ephraim, I want you to give me away. Before the parade passes by, I'm going to get in step while there's still time left. Before the parade 
passes by. Why, Irene, you're crying. Oh, Dolly, the world's full of wonderful things. Come with us, Dolly. I will, Irene. I will. Before the parade passes by, I'm going to go and taste Saturday's hot life. Before the parade passes by, I'm going to get some life back into my life. I'm ready to move out in front. I've had enough of just passing by life with the rest of them, with the best of them. I can hold my head up high, for I've got to go again. I've got to drive again. I'm going to feel my heart coming alive again before the parade passes by. Look at that crowd up ahead. Listen and hear that brass harmony growing. Look at that crowd up ahead. Pardon me if my old spirit is showing. All of those lights over there seem to be telling me where I'm going. When the whistles blow and the cymbals crash and the sparklers light the sky. I'm going to raise the roof. I'm going to carry on. Give me an old trombone. Give me an old baton before the parade passes by. Passes by. Listen and hear that brass harmony grow. The parade passes by. Pardon me if my old spirit is showing. Substitution. Miss Money had a sudden urgent business appointment at the Mint. They ran a little short and she's helping out. Well, she'll meet you at the Harmonia Gardens restaurant at 8 o'clock tonight. The Harmonia Garden? That's the most expensive restaurant in the city. And well, it should be. What food and the fastest waiters in New York. By the way, I might be a little late, so Miss Money will meet you in front of the restaurant. Wait until you see her, Horace. All in mustard yellow with a nice green feather and humming an old-fashioned tune. Yes, sweet Rosie O'Grady. You couldn't miss her if you tried. All right, Mrs. Levi. I'll meet Miss Money at the Harmonia Gardens tonight. 
but only because I paid for the introduction, and I plan on getting my money's worth. But from now on, you are hereby discharged as my marriage broker. Do you understand that, Dolly Gallagher? From now on, you are just like a woman like anyone else. He's as good as mine. I'm gonna raise the roof. I'm gonna carry on. Give me an old trombone. Give me an old baton. Before the parade passes by.
But don't you think you ought to call a hack car or else we won't get to the Harmonia Gardens on time? Oh, there's one. You who come oh, here. Oh, we're gonna do that, Mrs. Malloy. It isn't the money or anything. It's just that nowadays, really elegant people never take hats. Hats is out. Uh, they all go by streetcar. Day three Vanderbilt, by Mr. Morgan. Then by all means, a streetcar. Imagine. I've been elegant all my life and never even knew it. Of course, if you really want to be elegant, we do. You walk. Yes, New York. It's really us, Barnaby and Cornelius. All the guests of Mr. Hackle are feeling great and look spectacular. What a knack there is to that acting like a born aristocrat. We've got elegance. If you ain't got elegance, you can never, ever carry it. Inside, may I? Yes, Mr. Hackle. May I put my arm around your waist? Yes, Mr. Hackle. But I might as well warn you, a corset's a corset. <laughs>
Time, Barnaby. Champagne and hot house peaches and Neapolitan ice cream. And Barnaby, give the band leader a nickel and tell him to play to a wild rose. We want music while we dine. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
He's a nickel for the band leader. Would you please tell him the play has wild as a... There's money! Oh, hey, Bert. Hey, Bert, where's my purse? My wallet! Hey, you, that's my purse. Give it here. Miss Money, get off that table and get me to the Excuse me, but that's my wallet. I know it's mine because there's nothing in it but two dollars, three dimes, and... Cornelius! Cornelius! Did he say two pheasants? Three, four, pheasants for the house! And don't worry if we don't get to see the well. I'll buy one of my own. Sir! Sir! Fuck's sake! Shouting! How many times have I told you, boy, not to shout? This is a harmonious dance restaurant. Not one of those. But sir, she's here. The lady. What? Are you sure, boy? Like you told me, sir. Eight o'clock on the shop. Up on the carriage. I'll set this tall lady in an elegant red dress and the biggest handbag I ever saw. It's she! It's Mrs. Levi. She's back! Rudolph, is it true? I heard something about something outside the kitchen window. And it sounds like... It is! It's Sally! French velvet man! She just stepped out of our carriage! Rudolph, is it true? No? Oh, yeah. She's back! All right, Rudolph, it's like old times again! Sir? Sir? Rudy! She's here! <laughs> Sadly, Dolly, 
me, girly. Golly. Golly, Gallagher. What are you doing here? In that jail. And a half an hourly. And I demand an explanation Ernestina. of... Ernestina. Exactly. Ernestina, whom I trusted. She wanted me to do the hoochie-coochie. Well, she was always artistic. Horace, I'm going to have our table move down front. There's someone in the dance competition I particular want you to see. Another word about it. I'm as shocked as you are. I can't eat a thing. What have you ordered? A chicken, like you said. Now about that hoochie coochie girl. Did you say a chicken? Oh, I don't think I could face a chicken. Not a chicken. Not today. Not after what's happened. Good. They can't go like chicken. And bring a turkey. <laughs> what are you doing now? Nothing. Just looking the place over, getting acquainted with the surroundings. You know, that's the trouble with you, Dolly Gallagher. You always want to know what's going on. You're always sticking your nose in everyone else's business. Anybody who married you would get as nervous as a cat. What? What's that you're saying? I said anybody who married you would get Horace as... Vandergelder, get that idea right out of your head this minute. I'm surprised that you even mentioned such a thing. Understand once and for all that I have no intention of marrying you. I didn't mean that. Well, I certainly do hope not. Horace Vandergelder, you go your way, and I'll go mine. I'm not some Irene Malloy whose head can be turned by a few chocolate-covered peanuts, unshelled. Why, the idea of you even suggesting such a thing. You misunderstood me. Well, I certainly do hope not. But if I had any intention of marrying again, it would be to a far more pleasure-loving man than you. However, we won't discuss it anymore. Here's the waiter with our food. I'll serve Mr. Vandergelder Rudolph. Here's some white meat for you. And some dumplings, lighter than air they are. And some giblets, very tender and very good for you. Now, as I said before, you go your way and I'll go mine. Start right over the line. I'm sure you'll feel better at once. Would you have some of the fuck out? <laughs> <laughs> However, since you brought the subject up, there's one more thing I'm going to say. I didn't bring the subject up at all. One more thing I think I ought to say before we forget all about it. It's true, I'm a woman who likes to know everything that's going on, who likes to manage things, but I wouldn't like to manage anything as out of control as your household. You'll have to do that yourself, God helping you. Not out of control. Very well, let's not say another word about it. Have some beets, Horace, they're good. I don't like beef. That's good. No, Horace, a complaining, quarrelsome, friendless soul like you is no sort of companion for me. You salt your beef, and I'll salt mine. Will you stop saying that? I won't say another word. Good. Except this. At your age, Horace, you should enjoy hearing the honest truth. My age? My age? You're always talking about my age. Well, I don't know what your age is, but I do know that up in Yonkers with bad food and bad temper, you'll double it in six months. Have some more beef, Horace. They're good. I don't like beef. I hate beef. That's nice. Now dig right in. <laughs> yes, the pity of it is you could be a perfectly charming, witty, amiable man if you wanted to. I don't want to be charming. But you are. Look at you now. You can't hide it. Now sit down, Horace, and let's talk of something else. But before we change the subject, there's one more thing I'm going to say. No. You hold it right there, Dolly. Under no circumstances, in a million years, will I ever ask you to marry me? I suppose that means you want me to ask you. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Horace, I'm turning you down. How can you turn me down? I haven't asked you anything! It's no use arguing. I've made up your mind. Here, <laughs> let me cut your wings. I have a headache. I want to go home. You can't go now. The competition's about to begin. Here's a dollar, three dimes, five pennies, and a button. This isn't my purse. 
I want my purse. It's going to be that purse, Mrs. Bowles. Impossible. I can't imagine you without your purse. It's been together, Cornelius. You better get out of here. What am I going to do? I've never been here before. They don't know me. Stop eating that turkey. I can't pay for it. Horace, it's the latest thing. A polka. And there's one dancer I particular want you to see. Rudolph, move our table right down front so Mr. Vanderdeller can better observe his graceful movements. <laughs> witnesses, ladies and gentlemen, when I see upon that bench a brow that gleams with honor, a pair of snow-white whiskers that bristle with fair play, and a nose. I ask you to look at that nose, ladies and gentlemen, a nose as perfectly formed as the judicial system itself. Your Honor, I ask for freedom for my clients and a verdict of guilty for the only real culprit, Horace Vandergelder of Yonkers, New York. 
The one man responsible for these grievous charges of willful destruction of private property. A curtain torn, a face of bruise, and a solid ghost cup bent. Cruelty to a poor, <laughs> unfortunate minor. <laughs> Would you mind repeating that, dear? <laughs> Beg your pardon, Mrs. Levi, but if it pleases the court, I have something to say. I was just about to call you, Mr. Hackle. Go right ahead. Cornelius Hackle. If you dare testify against me, I'll have you discharged. You've already done that, Mr. Van Oh, I'll do it again. You've done it again, too. Ooh. But even if you hadn't, I'd still say what I have to say. I don't know much about disturbing the peace or inciting to riot, but I do know that what happened to me today, which is the most important thing that can ever happen to a man, might never have happened if I had obeyed your orders and stayed in Yonkers, New York. Your Honor... I'm talking about none other than love. Are you trying to tell me that after 33 years, you fell in love because they take one evening off? Oh, no, Mr. Van de oh. I didn't fall in love with Mrs. Irene Malloy of the city in just an evening, an hour, even that's too long. What's less than a minute? A second! Less than that. A moment! That's it. I'll go slowly so you can get it all down. It all. a moment for your eyes to meet and then your heart knows in a moment you will never be up in Yonkers for years and years, and all the time wonderful people like Mrs. Malloy were walking around to New York, and I didn't know them at all. I don't know if you can all see from where you're sitting. Well, for instance, the way her eye and her cheek and her forehead come together up here. Can you? I tell you right now, a good woman is the greatest work of God on earth. You can talk all you like about Niagara Falls and the pyramids. They aren't it at all. Of course, I've seen women before, but today I talk to one equal to equal. And they're so different from men. And they're awfully mysterious, too. Why, I bet you could know a woman a hundred years without ever being really sure whether she likes you or not. Today I've lost so many things. My job, my future, everything that people think is important. But I don't care. Even if I have to dig ditches for the rest of my life, I'll be a ditch digger who once had a wonderful day. Uh, I missed a few words back there, Mr. Hackle. Right after it only. Aches a moment, but his arms fell short and strong.
Well, Horace, there's your life. Without niece, without clerks, without bride, and without your purse. It looks like there's only one thing more to say. No! You just hold it right there, Dolly. I will never, in a million years, under no circumstances ever, ask you to marry me. Horace, that wasn't it at all. All I wanted to say to you was, goodbye. What? Goodbye. Now hold on, Dolly. It's no use, Horace. I fell. And when a woman fails, there's nothing more she can say. But... Hey. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. Don't try to stop me, Horace, please. Wave your little hand in whisper so long. That your life is dreary Don't you come a-knocking on my door For I'll be all dolled up And singing that song That says you dog I told you so So wave your little hands And whisper so long, dearie Dearie should have said so long, so long ago Because you treated me so rotten and rough, I had enough of feeling low. So wave your little hand and whisper, so long, dearie, dearie should have said so long, so long ago. For I can hear that shoot-shoot calling me on to a fancy new address. Yes, I can hear that shoot-shoot calling me on, on board that happiness express. I'm gonna learn to dance and drink and smoke a cigarette. I'm going as far away from Yonkers as a girl can get so. And on those cold winter nights, Horace, Snuggle up to your cash register. It's a little lumpy, but it rings. Don't come a-knockin', I'll be all dolled up and singing that song that says you dog, I told you so. So, Horace, you will find your life a sad old story when you see your dolly shuffle off to glory. Oh, I should have said so long, so long ago. Oh, 
I know just what you're going to say, Horace. You're not satisfied with Ernestina. Well, I have another girl in mind for you. The ideal wife. But don't let me interrupt you. You were doing something. What were you doing? Getting Cornelius' money, Dolly. $146. And 35 cents. And 6,012 cents of mine. And the money my mama left me. $62.48. 38 cents. 48. Two, five. Somebody wants to save it upstairs. Money, 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 money. Mr. Vandergelder's money. It's like the sun we walk under. It can kill or cure. Vandergelder's never tired of saying that most people in the world are fools. And in a way, he's right, isn't he? Himself, Cornelius, Irene, myself. Yes, we're all fools. And we're all in danger of destroying the world in our folly. But the surest way to keep us out of harm is by giving us the four or five human pleasures that are our right in the world. And that takes a little money. The difference between a little money and no money at all is between you and me. And that can shatter the world. And the difference between a little money and an enormous amount of money is very small. And that can shatter the world. It's all in how you use it. As my late husband Ephraim Levi used to say, money, pardon the expression, is like manure. It's not worth a thing unless you spread it around encouraging young things to grow. Anyhow, that's the opinion of the second Mrs. Vandergelder. Which reminds me, I'm ready for that sign. What are you standing around for? I told you that goes in the front room, you idiot. Well, Horace, as I was saying, I found you the ideal wife. Listen, Dolly, I don't want you finding me no more ideal wives. If I want an ideal wife, I'll find her myself. And I have. And you, damn it. Why, Horace? I know I was a fool about Mrs. Malloy and that other woman, but forgive me and marry me. Horace, stop right there. What? What do you mean? You know as well as I do, Horace, that you are the first citizen of Yonkers, and your wife would have to be a somebody. Answer me. Am I a somebody? You are, wonderful woman. Oh, you're partial. <laughs> no, it won't be enough for you to load your wife with money and jewels. To insist that she be a benefactress to half the town. By the way, it's bad business letting Cornelius open up a store right across the street from you. Better take him back and let him be your partner. Partner? And Barnaby can have Cornelius' old job. Now hold it right there, Doc. That way we'll all be together so we can dance at Ermengarde's wedding. Oh, that does it. You've gone too far, Dolly. That's the last straw. I'll dance at no wedding. Besides, I don't know how it take much. Here, please, please. All right, I'll dance. Horace, I never thought I'd hear you say a thing like that. What are you doing now? I said that goes in the front room, you idiot, the front room. Horace Vandergelder, what is going on up there? I just figured I'd have that front room done over in blue wallpaper. Horace. I know the old paper ain't worn yet, but, well, he's just set up in business, and I figured I'd give him a good start. It's like I always say, Dolly, money, pardon the expression, is like manure. It's not worth a thing unless... Thank you, Ephraim. Hello. Dolly. Well, hello. Dolly. It's so nice to have you back where you belong. I never knew, Dolly. Without you, Dolly. Life was awfully flat, well, more than that is awfully wrong. Here's my hat, Horace. 
I'm staying where I'm at, Horace. Dolly, you'll never go away. Wonderful woman. Again. Thank you.